Hello everyone and welcome back to another U.S. History 11 lecture and we're going to talk about the age of federalism. This is a period where it's probably necessary that we do have some conversation about it because this period from 1788 to 1800 is the period by which or when the country would literally form itself. So we've had and we've seen the destruction of the British Army, their surrender of Cornwallis, and the assumption of the colonies by the Americans and their quest to form a provisional government, continental congresses for the provision of war, and now we need to see them come together to form a constitutional or a nation-building conference that will set the seeds and tone for the rest of the coursework. We'll be able to see how all of this stuff starts to interconnect with each other. So really what we're looking at from 1788 to 1800 is the golden age of uh, American history, really. It represents a 12-year period where the um, historians who have been writing about this period literally call this the age of passion. And it aroused passions largely because there were deep anxieties over particularly the very character of the American Republic. And not only that, they were attempting to establish a system of collecting money in the form of a treasury, public finance. And so these were things that they know they needed to do to pay down war debts, for example, um, and also because it is just for the general administration of the country. But they also had other nagging concerms, and of course these arose some deep anxieties about whether or not the individual states would have more power than this national government. And if there was some form of national government, what would the scope of this national government be? Certainly the framers, right, or the architects of this new nation certainly didn't want to go back to the system, although it was proposed by John Adams, go back to a system where they had a, an inherited uh, monarchy to a certain extent. So the questions were nagging and it roused lots of concerns were over the rights of individual states. And of course, these would have deep ramification for the overall complexion of society and the condition of public morals. So what we can kind of think about this in some ways is that we know that we needed an effective government to do things, to raise public finance, to, uh, and of course that public finance would go to things like uh, paying for militaries, right? Then we also have this competing notion about whether or not the states themselves would have more power uh, than the national government. And so what we'll see over time in the thinking here early on was that the individual states should retain the majority of power, and, but then some power needed to be manifested over to a national government. So we're always going to see this tension from here on out between the idea or the people that support a strong national government and individuals who want to make sure that power is retained in the states. And I'll just say this much for now, and the, partly the reason why people wanted to maintain power in the states is because they feared concentrated power in the hands of a few people in a particular location. So what they were aiming for is you would have power spread out amongst the 13 states and later on more states when they came in. And then each of these states would have a governor, a legislature, and it would be those legislatures would be formulated and directed, directly tied into the very people that um, vote, voted these legislatures in. So early on, power is really going to be centered within the governors and the uh, legislatures of the states. It's not going to be until the Civil War where the federal government becomes actually more powerful. But what this really does is that these questions and concerns and the passions really is going to outlie some great anxiety within America and it will highlight and illustrate 
not only the dysfunction of American society at the time, but the antagonisms and deeply rooted opinions and prejudices. And of course, these deep opinions and deeply rooted prejudice would be geographic, you know, not knowing what other people have in mind who live, you know, five or six hundred miles away in a different kind of setting in a society. You would come, you know, to the table. You might be a slave owner in the South. You might be an individual who, let's say, is a Quaker in the North who dislikes slavery and wants to see slavery abolished. So you're going to have these arguments, right? People who want um, the state governments and local governments to have more power than the national governments. And of course, all of this is tied around jealousy and ambitions. And of course, we can never get beyond this central point, and that is the evils of slavery. So this American dysfunction, it's sort of like it's inherent contradictions already built into the society, particularly with the evil of slavery looming large and this inability to really come to terms with, they've got to decide on what type of a government um, to have. Now, what's going to be a really important factor in this is going to be the Articles of Confederation. So after the Revolutionary War, there needed to be, of course, a consensus on how the government would be put together. And so they called or they wrote this document that would allow them to govern uh, the existing 13 con uh, colonies. And it, this came to force in March 1781 by the Second Continental Congress. And from reading from your book, you'll probably be able to get some appreciation for Benjamin Franklin's Albany Plan. So if you read that, um, what Balin has to say about that, you'll be able to see some semblance of uh, where the two sort of meet. So this isn't like we're having people in uh, Congress at the time period in the early uh, evolution of the country where they were just putting together a constitution. No, they had already documents by which they could build upon right, that were done prior to the um, ending of the war that they could then just use as sort of a footprint. So the Article of the Confederation really in many ways resembled Franklin's, Ben Franklin's Albany Plan. But immediately upon passage of the Articles of Confederation, there were of course difficulties. And one of the most important one that really stood out is that there was no way in the Articles to raise a national army, and they also didn't have a judicial branch that would be able to solve some of the national disputes that would normally arise from just the day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year governance. So, and it also, this no way to raise a national army, right, is, is obviously for defense and in some cases offense, that it showed some weaknesses and flaws in the fact that there was no real true foreign policy. So if you can kind of think about you have 13 colonies with 13 governors, with 13 different legislatures, and people living in various regions who are trying to forge themselves as a new nation, and they have no ability to raise a national army. So in terms of defense, the only military they have are the state militaries. And so then the question you may want to ask yourself is, what happens if we were invaded and one of the states refused to send troops? Right? So if you had a national army, then you wouldn't have to worry about that because the national army then could be put out into the field in the defense of all the states. So what happens if there um, are disputes between two states in terms of, let's say, a dispute over land? How would that be adjudicated? Right? So you would need some type of a judiciary to be able to solve these kinds of claims. And also, imagine if you had 13 different colonies who might have 13 different ideas about how they should interact with other nations. So you, what you could literally have, in theory, is 13 different treaties signed with one foreign country. And so not having a foreign policy is a huge problem. And of course, the idea of no universal coinage, people are using an array of coins, some banks are issuing their own money, so you might have banknotes from a bank in Virginia, and you might have banknotes 
from Maryland, and you may not be able to spend them in either one of those states, right? So if you went to Tennessee to buy something and you had banknotes from Maryland, that cash may not have been recognized. So commerce then becomes a problem across state lines. And so then that hints is the problem with interstate commerce. How do the states and the people in the states deal with each other and trust each other and know that they will get a fair bargain for the goods and services that they are in fact selling. So quite honestly from this, you can see that these flaws would necessitate then a new constitution. And the individual that would offer this up first was Alexander Hamilton, who's consistently urged for a restructuring of government, right? And so then the first thought process that we have to kind of really get into our minds here is, is that you already have an existing document, the Articles of Confederation, so what you really need to do is to amend the Articles of Confederation. Now, if that is the process, you amend your Constitution, then the question would come around, is that what happened to the Articles of Confederation? So what you're really literally thinking about, and, and, and I want you to, to sort of grapple with right now, is this idea that you have a binding confederation around these articles and that if you recognize that there's changes that need to be made, why don't you just amend the articles? Why would you need an entirely new U.S. Constitution and completely discard of the articles? And the other question would be is, is that did the American people ever get a chance to vote on getting rid of the articles of confederation? Maybe they liked them. Maybe they wanted things to remain that way. Did they get a chance to vote on the new constitution or was this constitution simply given to them? And so then the question that you can ask is that who gets the right to decide how everybody else will be governed? How democratic is that? So these are some of the kind of questions you should be thinking about and even in some attempts, there may be even a couple of papers or writing ideas that you can get out of from that. So. The vital amendments, of course, would be doing things like regulating commerce, raising revenue, establishing a judiciary as well. So the framers decided to have a convention in May 1787, right, where the states would appoint delegates and they would, uh, for all practical purposes, figure out how to form or create a national government consisting of a Supreme Court a and a slash judiciary and a supreme legislature and an executive. And almost immediately when the convention met, the group split into two camps, and these two camps would be the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. And so I guess by the name you can automatically see that the Federalists would be individuals who would call for a strong national government, and the Anti-Federalists would be those people who would want more power resting in the states, who would in fact distrust concentrated power in the hands of a few. So this group splintered between the Alexander Hamilton faction and the Thomas Jefferson faction. And of course, Alexander Hamilton would be leading the Federalist faction and Thomas Jefferson would be leading the Anti-Federalist faction. So it's worth just taking a moment to just look at these competing factions in the drafting of the Constitution. So the Federalists, by and large, would advocate for strong national government and strong and weaker state governments, and they would inherently make up what we call creditor elements, people who tend to lend money, bankers. So strong national government, they would advocate weaker, subordinate state governments, and then creditor elements. And so the question that you can search for in, in Balin is why the advocating of stronger national government, weak state government, and partly uh, this has to do with commerce, right? And of course, that would be creditor elements. And how commerce comes into this is that you could appoint people that would be in charge of ensuring that the United States becomes a strong economic power rather than have 13 different groups in these 13 different states trying to figure all of that out on their own. You could have a centralized location for that. 
and it, that will eventually come in the form of a national bank, which you'll read later when you get to Andrew Jackson. So these creditor elements, the bankers and the people who advocate for a stronger national government, the Federalists, are typically located in the North and in cities. So the question here to ask yourself is why in the North and why in cities? And your book will probably highlight that um, extremely well. Okay, so then the anti-federalists then would be individuals who would be advocating just the opposite. Strong state, state governments and weak national governments. And of course, if the federalists tend to be creditor elements, then the anti-federalists would be debtor elements. Now, ironically, you, we can see this sort of opposites continue in the sense that the anti-federalists would be located in the South and typically in the countryside. So we have this geographic division, North versus South. Then we have a locality uh, issue here with cities versus the countryside. And then we have this strong versus uh, strong state governments versus strong national governments and then debtor elements, banks, and then creditor elements. And what we mean here by creditor elements are essentially people that uh, lend a lot of money out, and debtor elements, again, are people that borrow a lot of money. And the people that typically would borrow a lot of money, if you can imagine this, would be like farmers, right? So farmers borrow money because they need to buy seeds and implements and put in their crops. And then once their crops come in, they sell those crops and then they're able to go pay off their debts. And so here is a map that kind of illustrates where these debtor and creditor elements would be. The anti-federalists are in the yellow and the federalists are in the green. And so you can see on the in the north in places like New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, almost completely uh, Federalist. And then when we get to the v Virginia, North Carolina, and upper state New York, and some areas of Pennsylvania, rural, large portions of uh, North Carolina and South Carolina, clearly they are Federalist. Okay, so then of course, what is one of the hallmarks of American society is the idea of the compromise. The whole national government and the Constitution was forged from compromise. Benjamin Franklin, our old friend here, um, comes in with some way to figure out how um, to get all of this stuff going. One of them was whether or not issues about representation, whether or not they should count slaves, how to give the states more power, in the face of a federal government that over time may get more power, right? So they would figure out these, how to discriminate between the two spheres for the local and the general. And of course, dealing with the issues of uh, state power and the preservation of state power. So this group, uh, along with uh, Washington and, of course, um, with all these lingering issues, they had to, of course, do things like settle land disputes and other claims. So the delegates met in 1786 to discuss matters, and it turned into a full-fledged discussion or general discussion on a having a constitutional convention to propose an entirely new constitution. Elbridge Geary described this convention as an access of democracy. And again, I'm just going to highlight here again some of the issues, large versus small states, tax collection, creditor-friendly policy, controlling finances, and of course, controlling excess of each of the branches of government. So one of the people that you should kind of be aware of is Alexander Hamilton, 1755 to 1804. Alexander Hamilton is born in the West Indies. 
and he gives one of the lengthiest speeches for the convention and talking about the natural sem uh, separation of the few from the many, the well-born from the rabble. Uh, Alexander Hamilton will loom extremely large because his idea of the U.S. government or the, the national government, that it would be, in fact, a strong government. And he offers up a quite a number of things that Balin will go into in some discussion. Things that you should be aware of are how do we choose and form a legislative body? We would choose um, House of Representatives and a Senate, how those would be selected, how members of high office would be selected. Um, so all of these things would be uh, on the topic, whether or not people, how they should vote, who would have the opportunity to vote, um, and et cetera, and what type of government they should form, right? All of these were on their minds. So things like who should get the right to vote, whether there would be questions about race, religion, gender, um, People understood some very basic facts, like if people did get the right to vote, they would never willingly give it up, right? Um, they discussed whether or not the general public ought to be electing members to Congress. They decided that for the House of Representatives, the American public would elect them, but that in the U.S. Senate, those would be appointed by the legislatures and the governors of those states. And of course, that would change later, but this was for much of American history what happened. They also d decided that the states would decide who could, in fact, vote. And of course, this is going to be problemat uh, problematic a couple of centuries later in the Civil Rights Movement, where the southern states, by and large, had excluded African Americans and most other minorities, if not all, um, from the right to vote. And the national government could um, do so much to induce um, the uh, southern states to allow minorities the opportunity to vote. And, of course, that would have been done by legislation um, for the most part. They talked about things like who should elect the president. Should it be a direct election? Um, some people argued that they ought to have uh, the legislators, the people in the House and the Senate pick because they were well-born, better educated, they would know better. So Madison came up with a compromise that they should build together a college of electors chosen by state legislatures and this would be done by the state's population, and they would actually vote to recommend, to, to name who was president of the United States. And if there was a tie, the House of Representatives would have the right to break the tie. And so this is where the Electoral College comes from. Now, there have been some slight changes to that, right? But um, this is essentially what the origins of the this, the uh, electoral college come from, that the framers were not sure that the general public had the education and the um, sense of uh, intelligence, really, to elect a president. So they wanted that to be left up to um, th these people chosen by the state legislatures. Now, again, you'd say, well, why would they allow the states to do that? And you have to remember that this, again, is another way for the um, anti-federalists to ensure that power would be remained in the states because they uh, ultimately get together to choose who is going to be president of the United States and not the people. So we, of course, when it comes to slavery, there is problems and these basically boil down to small states versus large states, um, also from the South versus the North, right? The larger states like Virginia wanted to count their slaves to add to the overall population so they would get more members of the House of Representatives. 
particularly even those states like South Carolina, which didn't have very uh, a very large population, but did have a substantial uh, number of slaves, they would in fact get more representation. And so small states in the North, like Rhode Island and New Hampshire objected to this because there were virtually no slaves in those states. And of course, then that diminished the number of people in the House of Representatives. And so the compromise for this was to then allow the, the states to count their slaves, right? And so what we would get from that is what we would call the three-fifths compromise. So they would count three out of every five slaves instead of counting the entire allotment. And what that would consequently do is usher in what they called the uh, slave power. So southern states would gain more power for nearly 100 years in the United States simply because they would import more slaves and those extra slaves would give them more members in the House of Representatives. And what that meant is that any bills that were going through Congress that would try to abolish slavery, of course, would be fought back by the slave powers or the slave states. Of course, in terms of general representation, uh, Benjamin Franklin, through his New Jersey plan, offered the idea of the direct election, excuse me, <coughs> of the House of Representatives. And the House would be made up, of course, through the state's population. And, of course, that's proportional representation. The Senate would um, receive two members from each state and, of course, elected by the senators. Now, this idea of proportional representation here, we've just discussed that and talked about that just a little bit. And so... This comes from James Madison. Again, it is the three-fifths compromise. Now, with the fact that they were changing the U.S. Constitution, one of the real questions was, how could they build popular consent for this Constitution? Well, they came up with a really ingenious plan, and that was to submit a series of newspaper articles beginning in 1787 and lasting through 1788, that would state the case to the people about why the Constitution was necessary. The writers wrote in pseudonames, and it wasn't, of course, until later that people realized, and historians have talked about this to a great deal, who these were, and they were John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, of course, people who would have been Federalists, um, and of course, they, in fact, wanting this Constitution that would put in place a national government. And of course, the, what they would have believed is a reasonably strong national government. The most important of these Federalist articles was number 10, and this one talks about the tyranny of the majority and how that can come about in ways that the Constitution will avoid that. So we can take a look at the preamble of the Constitution that begins foremost with the people. So remember in our last discussion where we talked about how this transference of power from the people, from one entity over into the legislature. So we can see this clearly in the preamble where it says we, the people of the United States, are going to form a more perfect union, and by doing so, we establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, in other words, enter peace, and then we will promote and provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our future generations. We do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And so when we see from that, again, you have to hold in your mind this idea of power emanating or coming forth and being transferred from the people over to a governing body. So Article 1 says all legislative powers herein shall be vested in a Congress, which we know is the Senate and House of Representatives. There will be an executive branch, which will be the president and the vice president. 
the judiciary, which will be the Supreme Court and the lesser courts that may have been established by the higher courts. The influential texts that greatly influenced the founders um, were the texts that pretty much any learned individual, whether they were in Europe or in the United States, would have all read. So whether or not you received a formal education at a school or a university or you were homeschooled by your parents if they could afford it, you would have read Politics by Aristotle, Discourses on Livy by Machiavelli, you would have read John Locke's Two Treaties on Civil Government, and these by and large would have been the very foundations which you would have drawn from in order to have built this uh, new nation. And so you can think about with Aristotle from 350 BC to forward all the different types of governments that um, have been produced or developed by modern civilization. And of course here Machiavelli is going to argue that a republic right, is the best form of government and then with that republic comes this idea of social contract where the constitution basically outlines our rights and the responsibilities and roles of the government and that inherently is a contract. We get our Bill of Rights from Patrick Henry, who, of course, with this, you see this clearly outlined in Federalist Number 10, this idea of tyranny, but this one is the tyranny of the few, which would be the federal government. So individuals like Patrick Henry wanted a Bill of Rights to spell out the immunities of individual citizens. So literally what the Bill of Rights are is a document that says that the U.S. government with all of its power cannot abridge certain rights of its citizens. The earliest arguments, and you will see this clearly in Balaam's writing, is that many people thought, particularly Alexander Hamilton and Madison, is that there would be no need for a Bill of Rights because the um, all of an individual's rights would be incorporated within each of the state governments. But individuals like Patrick Henry, who was an anti-federalist, would have argued that they didn't trust right, what could happen down the road and that power has a way of um, really not only just corrupting, but power knows no limits. It seeks out more power. And so this Bill of Rights, they, Patrick Henry thought, was in fact necessary. And so they literally were not going to sign the U.S. Constitution unless they could have these guarantees. And so you should have some idea what these rights are. And of course, we can look at the first one, and the First Amendment, which says, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion. So if you remember from your readings in England, the Church of England was the state religion. Now the United States would have no state religion. The protection of free speech or the abridging of that speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress. And this one, of course, is in the news a lot. And this is the Second Amendment the right to bear arms, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of our free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. People have often made the arguments that the Second Amendment doesn't guarantee people the right to vote, I mean a right to have arms, uh, excuse me, um, and that what it does is that it gives people the right to um, have arms only if you were involved in a militia. And the, the, I think the proper historical answer to that is that the framers of the Constitution would have recognized that every able-bodied man uh, would have access to firearms and their own personal firearms. There is just probably no historical evidence that would suggest that there was any remote talk about abridging people's rights to have arms. This comes from essentially old English law, 
where the individual, the male, would have been called to the battlefield and you would have brought your own weapons to that battlefield. You wouldn't have gone to an armory and been issued a rifle and powder. That was something that largely you would have brought to the fore. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, the right to people to be secure in their purpose, their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. This is one of the most uh, debated, contested, argued uh, of the amendments, of course, because people are being stopped by the police and the police are demanding that they can search you or your house or your automobile. And then the question arises, whether or not they can do that without a warrant, right? And of course, the police will make the argument that by the time we got on a, a warrant, the criminal would have gotten away, so we had no time. And these are the major discussions, right, that surround that, right? Whether or not the police actually need a, a warrant for a whole slew of uh, activity uh, involving searching your person or your houses, papers, and effects. The Fifth Amendment, the right against self-incrimination. Sixth Amendment, speedy trial by jury. Seventh Amendment, trial by jury. Eighth Amendment, no excessive bail or excessive fines or cruel and unusual punishments. The Ninth, the limits on government power. And of course, Tenth, the state's rights. So anything not delegated by the Constitution or prohibited by the states are reserved by the states or to the people. So if it's not written in the Constitution, we just assume that we as people have the right to do it. Okay, so we know that from our discussions, we've just been talking about some issues here. And one of the most important ones was the concept and the issue of whether or not slavery would be a part of the new nation. So individuals like Sojourner Truth, who was one of the great advocates for abolition, looked at the Constitution and said this aptly. From a distance, the wheat field looks fine, but up close, one might see the ravishes and blight. The Constitution feels the same. I look for my rights and there ain't any there. The Constitution, like a wheat field, has a little weevil in it. So what she is inherently talking about here is that when it comes to the rights of, uh, and you can say this about women as well, uh, and, and slaves, right, you would not find their rights. And again, this is one of the great inherent contradictions. So what we can say from the Constitution, because it did not outlaw slavery and it allowed states to count slaves, and the, the Constitution will also have a provision in it where the importation of slaves into uh, the Americas would continue until 1808, and then it would be illegal. That didn't mean that slavery would be illegal, just the importation of slaves into the United States would be illegal. So if you wanted to have slaves in the United States, they would have to literally be homegrown. So you can see from this that the Constitution endorsed the apprehension and return of slaves to their masters, the continuation of the slave trade until 1808, and of course, granting more representation through the Three-Fifths Compromise. So if we had to sum everything up, we would say that the U.S. Constitution, of course, sustained slavery. We see the Three-Fifths clause within Article 1, Section 2. For black people, the framing of the Constitution was quite problematic in that black people would, of course, be disenfranchised, um, particularly uh, after the Civil War. But there would be always these lingering questions about whether or not black people would be protected. When the Constitution was written, most black people just naturally assumed that their rights as citizens were, in fact, covered by the Constitution. And in theory, they were absolutely correct. There was no mechanism at this particular time period that would determine, literally, 
who was a citizen of the United States, it was taken for granted that if you were in fact a citizen of your state, that you would by default be a citizen of the national government. So if states in the South would want to ensure that black people would not gain any power, the obvious thing to do would be to deny them state residency, and of course then they would not have uh, citizenship nationally. And so what's going to happen is that the states are going to seize upon this flaw in the Constitution and begin to work to delimit the rights of black people, um, particularly after the Civil War around the 1890s. This is going to be ultra problematic. And of course, we will see from the Dred Scott decision um, where Justice Taney declares that black people are in fact not citizens of the United States. And of course, the uh, 14th Amendment would be instituted in, during the Civil War to ensure that black people, in fact, were citizens of the United States. So what the Constitution literally did for black people is it failed to determine whether or not um, how one could become a citizen, and then therefore these racist regimes in the South would, of course, move to disenfranchise black people. Right. And so you had also, in some cases, the fact that states would try to bar black people from entering those states. So what we get from this is the rhetoric of the Constitution and how it literally uh, would be... Um, used by all different kinds of groups, right, to prod the nation's conscience in one direction or another. So, of course, here there would be arguments about state power versus national power, whether or not blacks were citizens and not citizens. And, of course, that would have deep ramifications because of blacks, of course, who were born in this country were not citizens. People who were not Caucasian or European descent who came to the United States. If they were deemed to be minorities, of course, they would not have citizenship as well. So we can see from this that there were lots of um, rhetoric about the Constitution, concepts about taxation without representation, and whether or not blacks should in fact pay their taxes if they were not in fact being allowed to vote, etc. Voting essentially was therefore then extended to white male property owners. We'll skip through this. Okay, to sum up, what we can say is that the age of federalism was dominated by large personalities, ratification of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, the Great Compromise became the benchmark and hallmark of America, and of course the compromises, some of them like slavery, would be the Achilles heel for America, and of course slavery is, was enshrined in our Constitution. All right, so once you've read the chap necessary chapters, it should fill in quite nicely what I did not cover. And if again, if you have any questions, um, you can get back to me.